Our hymn of the day for the second Sunday after Epiphany, like the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, is the summons, or will you come and follow me, from the Iona community. Iona, a small island off the Argyle west coast of Scotland, has been a holy site for 1,500 years. It is thought to be the first Christian site in Scotland. The ancient Celts described this as a thin place, a place where the veil between heaven and earth is lifted, and a place where mere mortals might catch a glimpse of the divine. Saint Columba established the Iona religious community in 563. Two students at the monastery school were Aidan and his friend, Prince Oswald. In 635, Prince Oswald was crowned king of Northumbria upon his father's death, and Abbot Columba sent Aidan to help the king bring Christianity to Northumbria. Aidan established the first monastery at Lindisfarne on Holy Isle right near the king's castle at Bamberg. Years later, both monasteries were sacked by the Vikings. A Calvary group explored this history two years ago on a trip in the footsteps of St. Aidan. In 1938, the Iona Abbey was rebuilt and established as an ecumenical community of men and women whose main tenets are peace, justice, work in poor neighborhoods, a new economic order, and worship renewal. Their publishing company, Wild Goose Worship Group, is regarded in Britain as one of the most innovative and authentic sources of new congregational song. John Bell, our composer, was born in 1949 in Kilmarnock, Scotland. Kilmarnock is about 30 miles southwest of Glasgow and is most famous as the home of the Johnny Walker Whiskey Distillery. Bell used the Scottish folk song Kelvin Grove as the melody for the summons. Through the Iona community, Bell has published collections of original hymns and songs aimed at worship renewal along a wide range of liturgical materials. We know him also at Calvary for Take, O Take Me As I Am, Goodness Is Stronger Than Evil, and He Came Down That We May Have Love. Bell studied at the University of Glasgow, where our Calvary group had lunch by the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery in Root Hall, en route to Inverary, where we began our exploration of Aidan's journey. Bell was eventually awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Glasgow, but as an undergraduate, he took a time off after only three years of study to do volunteer work in a deprived neighborhood in London. He then set off to Amsterdam, where he served two years as an associate pastor at the English Reformed Church before returning to the university. Bell states, quote, after I graduated, I began working for five years as a youth pastor for the Church of Scotland 
serving a large region that included about 500 churches. I then went back and into Iona to focus on renewal of the church's worship because young people were either disenchanted with the church or would never go near it. I discovered that seldom did our hymns represent the plight of the poor. There was nothing that dealt with unemployment, with living in a multicultural society, with feeling disenfranchised, nothing about child abuse, nothing that reflected concern for the developing world, that helped see ourselves as brothers and sisters to those who are suffering from poverty or persecution. I knew some new hymns were needed, but I didn't favor the current popularity of using choruses or popular choruses. That, to my mind, represents only a fraction of God and a fraction of human experience. He rejects the description of his music as global. Quote, if I were to think of myself as some kind of global writer, then I would lose the spiritual plot of my life. My heritage draws on the experience of the Celtic Church, and our faith has been formed by living and working among impoverished communities. At Iona, Bell employs the process he calls corporate hymn writing, by which the community at Iona revises questions and then finally presents compositions to a congregation for feedback. Bell was the convener of the committee which drafted Scotland's 2005 church hymnary. Two of his books have been instrumental in guiding new hymnody, The Singing Thing and The Singing Thing Two. In 2017, the story of Lizzie Lowe, who committed suicide because she was afraid to tell her parents about her sexuality, led Bell to share that he was a celibate gay man. Before the hymn sing, let's hear Dr. Bell talk about worship. The worship that I believe it touches people profoundly is worship which is not sentimental, but is real. And I think that there's a temptation, particularly in North America, where I work for about three months of the year, to try to please people or to try to give people what they want in case they don't come back and the church runs short of money. But the worship I believe touches people is, is when what happens connects with both the scripture and the lives of the people. Now this, I mean, I remember this happened for me in a fairly dramatic way. I, the first time I went into an Episcopal church was when I was 19 and it was in Glasgow and it was St Mary's Cathedral and it was in, it was in Monday, Thursday because when I lived at home in Kilmarnock, I usually went to the Holy Week services. Now here's this church in which um, there's candles, which we didn't have in Kilmarnock and in which there's a robed choir, which we never had either. And it's Monday, Thursday, and it comes to the end of the service, and we begin to read Psalm, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as it's read, the choir take off their gowns, and they begin to take all the stuff out of the church. Uh, they take the cross, they take the candles, they begin to move chairs, and the lights are going out, and we're still reading this, this terrible psalm about how there's a victim who is being besieged by people who want to tear at his throat and end his life. And it ends in darkness, and then the congregation leaves without talking to each other. And I remember being, it was a conversion experience for me. I was more profoundly moved by that than by anything else, because somehow the action of worship, the reading of that psalm, and how I could run away from Jesus or be one of the people who persecute him. All these became real. And this was not something which was staged for emotion. This was something which was replicating in symbolic fashion what happened on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. It wasn't just the Last Supper. It was the abandonment of the disciples afterwards. Now, when we're able, and there's no, you know, it's not as if there's some formula, but when we're able to connect the words of Scripture to the experience of human life, then people either in joy or in regret will feel touched by God.